you so much for the um, opportunity to uh, speak to you all, for inviting me. And um, yeah, and thank you for that lovely introduction as well. So today I'm going to be talking to you about um, my research and give you quite a sort of broad brushed introduction to the type of research that um, I've been involved with over the last decade or more than a decade now, looking at reconstructing what I like to call living landscapes um, in the Pleistocene. So this is really about using isotope analysis, which many of you will be familiar with in terms of paleo uh, climate research, but here in terms of targeting the isotope analysis to um, animal remains. So um, conducting isotope zoo archaeology to better understand the late Pleistocene world um, that those animals and humans also inhabited. So um, first things first, um, I've got a little timeline up there just because I know we're in um, some of us are used to talking about the Eemian, the Vexelian, others, the late glacial, the late Pleistocene, the different MIS stages. So um, now and again, this little timeline will come up to just help us all be on the same page. Um, so my sort of jumping off point um, for this um, talk is really to say that in the late Pleistocene of Europe, animals are absolutely everywhere in the archaeology. So many of you will be familiar with these kind of images. These are images from Lascaux, which is a, a really famous Magdalenian um, site with a uh, cave site with lovely paintings attesting to um, the animals that were, were seen um, by the people living in that area at the time. Um, and there's many examples of animals, especially herbivores, in, in art like this across the uh, late Pleistocene world in Europe. But they're not just in art or not just in cave art. We also get animals in portable art. So these lovely figurines from Vogelherd Cave, but uh, there are many other examples of carved um, in this case, ivory figurines of animals. We of course get animal bone in um, archeological sites as the, um, the sort of waste products of human subsistence practices. So uh, we know that animals were, a, especially large ungulates were uh, sort of underpinning the economy in Northwest Europe during the late Pleistocene as well. So we know that they were a very important um, foodstuff for these uh, Northern hunter-gatherer groups in that time period. We also see animals in, uh, soft technology in organic technology. So things like uh, bone tools or tools that would be made of ivory um, um, and, uh, and antler, for example. And we can infer that bone needles like these would have been used indeed to um, stitch clothing that would have been made of animal pelts. So animals really are um, just everywhere and um, the sort of backbone of life. And I think the, the key thing to also think about, as well as thinking about those kind of very economic and sort of practical uses of animals is that in, especially in, in sort of um, uh, stepic or uh, sort of glaciated landscapes that might be largely treeless, animals, um, large herds of animals and um, uh, herding ungulates would be almost sort of uh, the main um, sort of architecture, if you like, uh, the main sort of physical features of these worlds that were occupied by people. And they would undoubtedly have occupied social space. They would have um, uh, been culturally significant, would have been linchpins for human culture, as well as sort of important in those economic ways I've highlighted. So I suppose I just really, um, like to impart the importance of, of animals in these spaces in everything from being, um, you know, in the case of mammoths, niche creators, quite literally, and where they migrate to and where they poop, um, all the way through being um, uh, sort of uh, focus points of human culture as well, from a pra practical point of view, but also in more perhaps um, esoteric ways. So, the study of um, animals in the past is generally referred to as zoo archaeology. And I don't know if many of you will be familiar with that as a subfield of archaeology, but I thought it would be good to introduce that. So it's the discipline that seeks to understand how and in what ways humans and animals in the past interacted. And of course, this is vital for all areas of archaeology, for example, from the advent of agriculture, looking at um, 
animal, uh, how humans interact with animals there, if you're looking at domestication, for example, or dairying or other aspects of animal husbandry becomes very important. Um, but it's also very important in, in, in archaeology pre-agriculture. So it can focus on subsistence and hunting strategies, domestication, like I said, but also um, looking um, through animal remains from the perspective of environmental and ecological change as well. And then using all of those things to better understand um, the human past. And isotope zoo archaeology, this is a growing subfield of, of zoo archaeology. And this is the application of isotope analyses to zoo archaeological remains. And like I said, there's a lot of focus um, in more recent time periods. So, for example, domestication or, or later periods in, in prehistory and in more historic archaeological periods. But in the Paleolithic as well, there's uh, uh, an increasing emphasis on, on these approaches. Now, I threw in the next slide because I wasn't sure of people's background and experience, but I appreciate this is uh, probably very introductory for many of you. I thought I should also say what an isotope is. Now I've said what um, zoo archaeology is, but yeah, please forgive me the specialists in this, that this is rather the ladybird introduction to isotopes. So in simple terms, isotopes are elements um, with the same number of protons and electrons, but a different number of neutrons, which gives them a different atomic mass. And because of this, the heavier and lighter isotopes behave differently in chemical and biological reactions, leaving distinct isotopic signatures in different organisms and, and parts of the ecosystem, and even within different tissues in our own bodies. Um, so the basis of this um, is, uh, in a nutshell, you are what you eat and where you eat it um, as, a, as a mammal. And archaeologists and paleoecologists um, have exploited these systems to analyze things like teeth and bones that we find in the archaeological record, either the mineral phase, so for example the tooth enamel, or through extracting proteins, things like bone collagen, targeting those tissues, and then analyzing the isotope ratios of those tissues, looking at different um, isotope systems, and then using those to better understand aspects of past diet, climate, and mobility, and then and today, these will be some of the things that I'll go over and introduce you to. So in terms of, of how we can use the, these approaches and what, what we can do with them, um, on the sort of most, uh, on, in, in terms of how these animal remains can tell us about the environment, on one of the most fundamental levels, we can literally use faunal remains as environmental proxies if we um, employ oxygen isotope analysis. And this is something that we've been looking at in recent years. I worked, I had a PhD student, Sarah Pedizani, who's done a lot of great work on this um, and has been really instrumental in kind of um, reviving this as a method and, um, and really exploring a, a lot of its uh, caveats and potentials. So how this works is, um, the principle behind this is that the oxygen isotope ratio of precipitation varies, as many of you all know, across landscapes, but also seasonally at single locations. And some of you may not realize this, but there's a direct relationship between temperature, between the oxygen isotope ratio of precipitation, and then also the oxygen isotope ratios of the biominerals of the animals that drink that environmental water, so their bones and their teeth. Now, the key thing here is that this method isn't designed to replace, you know, the incredibly, um, you know, valuable archives of climate that are, say, involved, uh, that are, say, embodied in um, ice cores or what have you, that you can give you long time depth uh, and insight into climate change over large periods. This is instead a method that's designed more to complement this within a terrestrial framework and significantly to connect climatic conditions to human actions, because one of the hardest things in archaeology is you can have fantastic paleoclimate records and you can have fantastic archaeology, but dating and cross-correlating those two things can be incredibly tricky. Now, the great thing about this approach is if you're targeting the tissues of an animal that was killed by people, and we have evidence of that at the site in terms of, say, cut marks on the bones, then we have that direct link between human activity and the animal itself. So um, the, the dating there is 
even if we don't have absolute dates is, is, is um, of those two things is the same. Um, and then of course you can radiocarbon date your bones and whatnot as well. So it's a, a, a way of providing um, those paleoclimatic insight, insights to life on the ground as experienced by people at those sites in that fully terrestrial context on the scale of individual lifetimes. So I'll, I'll maybe give you a bit of an insight into how this works. So we can do this in a kind of broad brush and kind of uh, what I would describe as a sort of bulk way. So here is some data from some um, horse tooth enamel from a um, early Emian of Excellian site that I worked on in Germany, Neumite Nord 2. And here we were aiming to sample the tissue in a way that it gave us an annual average in terms of the isotopic input. I'll explain in the next slide why that's important. And take uh, and took the um, oxygen isotope ratios from the tooth enamel. So here we're looking at the phosphate component. Now the chemistry behind this is it's fairly complex. You can also look at the carbonate component, which is more straightforward, but the phosphate, generally most of these conversion equations are based on modern, because um, you need a series of conversion equations to get from phosphate data to temperature data. Most of those are based on um, modern case studies and experimental studies with phosphate. And we know that it's it's the phosphate in the bio appetite, which is um, has a direct relationship to the body water and then the drinking water. So here we're targeting the phosphate group in the biomineral, we're um, isolating it as a precipitate of, um, of silver phosphate, and that's how we're analyzing it. And here you can see data from the, just to show, sort of show you that this works, we have um, different levels of Neumark Nord. We have early Eemian phases and then later phases when things were getting cooler. And indeed, you can see here that the this is mean annual temperature. Um, each of these equations have errors and every time you do an equation from, uh, well, you get the analysis itself, but then you convert it to predicted body water, to predicted drinking water, to predicted precipitation, to predicted temperature, you end up with a compound error, which is really important to take forward. So you can see why the error bars then get so big. But in general, it's very encouraging. We can see that indeed the early Eemian temperature in this neck of the woods was pretty comparable to that neck of the woods today and that temperature decreased during uh, across the different phases of the site and into the Vexelian was, was cooler. So um, it, it works. Uh, another approach you can take, and this is really about exploiting the um, uh, what we know about the formation times in the teeth, you can also sequentially sample the teeth to uh, get time series information and this is because we uh, we know how the teeth are forming in large ungulates like this this happens over um, uh, at least a year two years depending on the species and you can do incremental sampling you can see in the picture there and get um, uh, seasonal climate information so here's an example of that this is a site Abri du Marat that's in um, in the south of France it's a it's an upland site um, and with various occupations dating to around 40,000. And it's got, in, in the period where we did the oxygen isotope analysis, it's got quite a varied faunal spectrum, so different species present with evidence of spring, summer, and autumn occupations by Neanderthals. So this is a, a rock shelter where they're um, processing um, uh, animal carcasses amongst other things. And these are the kind of data you can get from uh, introduced sampling animals this way. So the, um, the green points here are the actual measurements. And then you have to, even prior to doing any of the conversion equations, you have to um, stretch out the signal because uh, we know from modern studies on uh, controlled drinking studies on horses and whatnot that the um, intratooth signal is somewhat attenuated. And that's due to the sort of um, uh, the uh, geometry of tooth formation, essentially. But when you go through all these different conversion equations, we get to um, an insight into seasonal temperatures that were um, with an overall annual mean annual temperature that was just slightly cooler than today in this period, but where seasonal temperature extremes were quite, especially the winter temperatures were quite a lot um, uh, more exaggerated. So we've got, we're getting an insight into past um, almost like hyper seasonality in this area compared to what it is like today, which gives us some insight into the world as experienced by Neanderthals and here perhaps why they avoided the area in winter time. <laughs> 
And we can use this to ask some really um, big questions of the past as well. We can use this approach. So um, we've uh, had had a paper out on this um, just recently, and then another paper that's just under review right now, applying this to what are called um, initial Upper Paleolithic sites in Europe. So these are sites that are produced by the earliest spread of modern Homo sapiens in Europe. So prior to the sort of Upper Paleolithic proper, as we would understand it, prior to the Aurignacian, there was a kind of free spread of Homo sapiens into Europe that have left a very um, difficult to trace record and they're quite enigmatic. Um, within the archaeological record. And one of the sites we looked at a few years ago was this site, Bashakiro, that's noted in red here. So Bashakiro Cave um, is in Bulgaria and it yielded a, a wealth of, um, of different artifacts, including these wonderful pendants and uh, that are manufactured by uh, cave bear teeth from cave bear teeth amongst other things and also very small fragments of tooth and bone that were identified using uh, peptide se sequencing and then ancient dna to being um, homo sapiens as opposed to neanderthal because this is a this is a time period that's contested in terms of we've got neanderthals and modern humans around at the same time so telling which sites belong to whom can be quite tricky but here we've got that um, that genetic evidence that's tying this site to early homo sapiens and we also had a lot of lovely animal bones at this site and teeth. And so one of the questions we wanted to ask at this site is what were these, what was the climate of these early expansions like? And it's long been considered that Neanderthals have sort of adapted to cold climates. They're, they're shorter, they're stockier, they're more robust. And that when early modern humans came on the scene, they may be spread in warmer fa fa uh, phases, sorry, of this period. Now, what's interesting is the earliest, the parts of the site that correlate with the initial Upper Paleolithic, actually using this technique, it seems that um, both the summer and winter temperatures were cooler than today, considerably cooler than today. And that tells us actually that the, this spread into this part of Europe for um, the earliest modern humans in that area, that they were dealing more with a, with a climate comparable to the subarctic today so actually it's kind of um uh refuting these 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 ideas that humans must have sort of um danced to the beat of the drum of the climate and only gone when you gone where it was very cold or when it was very warm so we're learning something about the kind of ecological tolerances of um and maybe the kind of uh, climatic niche if you like of uh, early humans in europe so there's other ways we can also use um <clears throat> animal remains to tell us about the climate in more indirect ways or their their animal remains I, I should say reflect the climate in perhaps more indirect ways um, so carbon nitrogen isotope analysis can also provide some insights um, it's of course a method that's used a lot in archaeology for exploring human diets and especially if you're not dealing with herbivores you see really nice trophic level relationships between animals using this technique um, but even with herbivores alone their, uh, the carbon and nitrogen isotope analysis of their bone collagen um, broadly reflects climatic variables. You can see here, these are, these are um, ungulate remains uh, from, this is a, a lot of data that was compiled um, in, in an early, uh, earlier study. You can see their, um, the average values of um, ungulate bone collagen through time varying with when you get to the uh, coldest phases, the glacial maximum nitrogen values are very low. This is all linked to soil productivity that's then passed on to the plants, that's then passed on to the animals. And you also get changes between the um, late Pleistocene and into the Holocene in terms of the carbon uh, values you get in those remains too that are related to atmospheric CO2. So you can see here uh, herbivores in the kind of broadest sense as reflecting um, the overall environment and environmental conditions. But where it gets confusing is we also get variations within herbivore communities that reflect their niche feeding behaviors and niche partitioning. Um, so you can see here, for example, that um, reindeer are often quite elevated in carbon relative to um, other herbivores. And this is because they have this capacity to eat lichen and in fairly large quantities. And, um, and that um, lichens tend to be um, to have 
uh, less negative carbon values, which then get passed up the food chain onto the reindeers. Um, you see something uh, kind of the opposite end with other deer species called the canopy effect, where you get lower carbon values in uh, forested systems and even in temperate forested systems this works and you see those values reflected in uh, leaf feeders who are living in forested environments so if we had a um, a red deer or a roe deer on this on this um, uh, plot here we might see them towards the more negative carbon values the issue is uh, for me using these two approaches is how can we tell these two things apart and importantly if things like herbivore dietary ecology change with climate change. So if we consider these things to be plastic rather than conservative, so for example, the extent to which reindeer eat lichen, then how do we extricate these two things when we've got a sort of moving baseline and then values that can move within it? And so when I started working at this site, Le Cote, which is in Vienne in France, um, I was very interested in pursuing. So it was, a, it was a site that was dating between 45,000 and 35,000 with really good dating between methods and really nice phasing and very good species representation of reindeer, bison and horse throughout the sequence. And so here I was really interested in looking at reindeer ecology through time and whether that and whether relative to other herbivores, the uh, extent to which they're consuming lichen was shifting. And we have in this period between 45 and 35, we're in a period of gradual climatic decline as we're kind of heading towards the next um, LGM. But at the site in particular, we have um, uh, it straddles the Heinrich IV event, which is known as being a sort of cold snap um, across northwest Europe. And as I said, we've got um, reindeer, horse and bison throughout the site and the fauna is attesting as well to that general climatic decline. Essentially, the proportion of reindeer goes up and up and up in this period as you get towards uh, 30, 25,000, for example. So we know we've got a, a gradual cooling. So here is the nitrogen isotope data from the site. And you can see here in the fauna that as we go towards, uh, generally throughout the site, we have this lowering that especially bottoms out in that um, four lower level, which is the, the level where we're seeing, which is um, coinciding with the Heinrich IV event. So here it's showing us that all the species are getting their lowest nitrogen values in this period. So, and this isn't because they're, um, they're suddenly changing from being carnivores to being you know, uh, herbivores, they're all herbivores, but this is reflecting a baseline shift in, um, in nitrogen through time. Now, what is interesting is with the carbon, at the same time that we get those, um, uh, at the same point that we get that kind of change in the nitrogen, what we see is an increased spacing between the rangifer and the other herbivores. And the extent to which we have that spacing is essentially telling us the extent to which Rangifer reindeer are eating lichens, and um, and and having a different diet from the from the bison and the horse. The horse here can be very much considered the baseline because they're an obligate grazer. So you can see here the green, they're um or they're they're more or less a grazer all of the time. You can see here the green doesn't shift so much that we get some change in the bison because you know they're a mixed feeder. Um, and the but the uh, the change that we get is in the reindeer. They're always on top, so they're always eating eating the lichens. They've always got that within their diet. But that spacing is really maximised in that coldest phase, which is telling us there that either through perhaps there being a higher abundance of lichens in those coldest phases, or there being more competition for graze in those con in those colder phases, or perhaps the reindeer themselves being more migratory in those phases and um, accessing different areas that had more lichens, we're seeing a difference in their diet that's kind of it being embodied in their, in the um, stabilized isotope chemistry of their bone collagen. Now, uh, finally, there's um, another aspect that we can look at, uh, or that, that I've looked at quite, uh, quite a, a bit over the last few years uh, to do with their um, ecology and that's movement ecology. And obviously, um, this is a really important aspect of understanding the behavioral ecology of animals in the past, but this is also something that can really be helpful in contextualizing human activities. The movements of animals, of the prey species that were really vital to human groups in the past can tell us lots of things about the contemporary ecosystem, but also about how humans um, sort of structured their world and their, um, 
seasonal movements, perhaps their seasonal use of the landscape. Um, we can analyze and, and look at, for example, and think about corridors and pathways across the landscape, can think about um, how contemporary groups of people may be related through, uh, through movements that might, for example, mirror or intersect animal movements. We can think about their hunting strategies, whether humans may have practiced, say, interception hunting or not. And it can help us think about uh, the seasonality of site use as well and the, the distribution of sites in an area and how they might reflect sort of more of a seasonal round rather than um, uh, rather than um, being used all year round. And the key thing here is that we can't just say, just like with uh, the example of the, the diet of the reindeer, we can't just say, oh, well, modern caribou migrate. Um, because they're not suitable analogues for how reindeer behaved in, say, France 50 or 70 thousand years ago. And we know from modern animals that, especially animals that can have different ecotypes like rangifer, that you can get very long distance migrants, but you can also get uh, virtually sedentary groups. So modern animals aren't suitable analogues, but they can be helpful in developing techniques. And one of the techniques that um, we use is strontium isotope analysis, which some of you may be familiar with if you're more familiar with geology. And this is looking at the ratio of 87 to 86, which increases generally from younger to older rocks. There can be also influences with the mineral content as well as with the age. And we get um, all kinds of impacts in terms of how uh, there's all kinds of factors that affect how that signal gets from rocks to soils, what we refer to as bioavailability. So how a signal gets up through the food chain. But generally, in the broadest sense, the local lithology remains the dominant source of strontium influencing um, what we call ice escapes, which are the sort of um, the geographical patterning you get in uh, the environmental variability, if you like, across a landscape in, um, in isotopes. And so we have this relationship between the bedrock, um, the, the baseline lithology that then gets into soils, which then gets into plants, and then um, strontium uh, commonly substitutes for calcium in skeletal biomineral. It sort of enters sneakily that way. So you end up with it in your, in your bioappetite. And so in the, to this extent, you are where you eat. And this is a method that's used in archaeology all the time, for example, for um, uh, provenancing uh, humans, human remains as well. So we use it to investigate human mobility, where people are born and whether it's different from where they died. Um, but you can also, again, use those incremental sampling techniques. And if you have an animal like a high crowned herbivore or even those low crowned herbivores, you can introduce sample and get time series information about where animals were during the formation of that tissue. Um, you can also take oxygen data like that horse data I showed you that was seasonally varying, and you can use that to anchor the strontium within a seasonal framework. We can also infer that seasonal framework from what we know about the periodicity of growth of, of animals, how their teeth grow, and their typical birth seasonality of wild ungulates, which tends to be sort of May for the species that we're, May or June for the species that we're looking at. So some of the first work I did um, in this area was to sort of test the methods. This was what I did for my PhD, was to take um, materials from modern caribou herds that had known migration patterns and to serial sample the teeth to see if indeed they had variations in their strontium isotopes that reflected their movement, um, movement ecology which uh, it was good because it worked. And um, it showed us, it gave us an impression of, of what we could achieve uh, applying this to archeological samples. So these are four reindeer. I'm taking two teeth here, the second molar and the third molar, which together form a time series in this animal of a little over a year. That can depend on where. So that's the extent to which the, uh, the teeth are in wear, which happens as they get older and as they're as they're eating, bits of the enamel near the surface wear away. But you can add together the second second molar, the third molar, and you get this long time series of about a year or a little bit more in reindeer. And the great thing is, is that in the case of these four individuals who are all from the same herd, and as I said, that the herd has a has a known um, pattern of movement. It's in the broader sense reflecting that movement. We have agreement between those four individuals that's reflecting their journey, in this case in Alaska, from um, older lithologies to younger lithologies and back again. 
And then uh, since then, we've applied this, this method using the strip sampling technique to different case studies. So here's an example from a uh, very recent, a more recent historic period in Alaska, looking at uh, the migration habits of caribou during the Little Ice Age and showing that they're different than in contemporary Western Alaska. So this is more sort of historic ecology. And then um, the first study that I, I did at a European Paleolithic site, so sort of demonstrating the seasonal movement behaviors of late Pleistocene reindeer for the first time. So since then, um, we've applied it to other sites. Um, here's Abu de Marara again, that site that I showed you on the, the one of the first slides with the horses and the seasonal temperature variation. And I think I mentioned there were a, a several different archaeological levels at the site here. Now, in archaeological studies, you're always limited by the material that you have. Here I've got three reindeer from one of those levels, but only a single reindeer from the other. That's because I need reindeer with a paired M2 and M3, which can be quite hard to find. But this was what I was able to get. And you can see here that the three reindeer from level 4-1 have got quite a different intra-tooth profile than level 4-2, which has a very different intra-tooth profile. And this is giving us a hint that we've got maybe a change or a difference in behavior through time. And what we wanted to do with this to take it sort of slightly further away from just interpreting graphs um, to say they went from an older or younger lithology, but to try to actually pinpoint where on the map they're going. And for that, we can use spatial assignment tools. So in the last sort of 10 years since I did my PhD, we've had a lot of bioavailability data published for, for large regions of Northwest Europe. So this is, if you like, the ice escape maps of strontium um, throughout Europe, people have been out and taken soils and taken plants and generated these wonderful ice escapes, which then allow us to better interpret the archaeological data. And now there's tools which help you take single points within um, that you have, say your summer peak or your winter trough in terms of the, the value that you have and give you a likelihood of where on a map it, that could be. So you can see here at the in the bottom, we've got an estimation of it's essentially a, a, a probability for different parts of the map being used in winter or summer. And in our um, our blue individual here, uh, this single reindeer from level four two, you can see that the summer and winter range, uh, we can't pinpoint because of the nature of lithology. There's many areas that match the summer and many areas that match the winter. However, what we can say is that the winter and summer are two distinct areas, whereas, um, i.e., they were moving between two different areas seasonally, so migrating, whereas one of these reindeer or these reindeer from level 4-1, their winter and summer ranges likely overlapped heavily. So that's evidence that they were non-migratory in comparison to the individual from 4-2. So here we're getting insight into changes in the behavioral ecology of this, um, of this species in late Pleistocene Europe. Now, our next steps with this are to see if we can take it even further. And for that, we, um, and whether we can actually reconstruct the migration route undertaken. And for that, this is a project that was funded by Leverhulme the last few years, was to try to develop um, new techniques of getting the data out of the teeth and then also working with the data um, and using different forms of computational modeling. So you can see here, this is comparing the sort of traditional strip sampling technique on those four reindeer with what we can achieve from laser ablation. So this is using um, uh, firing a laser as a and taking a, as a continuous raster down the tooth crown to, um, to generate many hundreds of measurements rather than say the six or seven that I might get from intratooth sampling. So you're essentially getting a, a much more high resolution data, which we think might be the key to um, moving towards reconstructing migratory pathways. So hopefully my video on the next slide works. So this is kind of where we're getting. Oh, this is just to tell you about the method. So we're now taking that kind of data, working with, an ice, with ice escapes. Luckily in Alaska, where those individuals come from, there's a really good um, ice escape with a, a high coverage of bioavailable sampling, which is great. And then what we've done with um, the laser data is I think it's every 20 measurements. So using the average down the tooth, every 20 measurement points, uh, Mayal, who's the technical wizard behind this, has been assigning each sample um, with a probability for each, each pixel of the ice escape to be the origin of any given value. And then trying to um, 
account for uncertainty and sample variability. So putting in a, a sliding standard deviation, but then importantly, adding a prior rule. So the prior rule is relating the previous assignment to the next. So it's about saying, if you like, the measurement here cannot be more than say, 30 kilometers away from this measurement, which can't be more than 30 kilometers away from the next measurement. So it's about trying to put that time series within a kind of relative, uh, uh, within a connected framework to try to map the journey across the landscape. So um, here is uh, Alaska, here is our probability scape across the ice escape, and here is one of our caribou, and I'm gonna press play, and hopefully you'll see the amount of green change. So we're starting in the summer, which is where our red point is now, and you can see there's hit rates uh, across different parts of Alaska. The, the bit in the lower part is the winter range here, where there's less of a hit rate, and there's a high hit rate here, there's lots of green, in the summer range, which is where we know, because this is a modern individual, we know where the animal is. So now we press play, hopefully, and I hope you're seeing this. And we see that green really strong in the summer range where we know they are. And then they're migrating and they're going down south and all the green is heading down south. And it's really only the very southern portion of the range where we're getting any hits now. Same here, we're now in the M3 and they're down in the south of the summer range, of the winter range, sorry and they're migrating again. They're heading back north. And we see that shift back to the mid of the summer range. So um, it's working. <laughs> we're very excited about it. And we're beginning to now apply it to our first Pleistocene um, studies in, in France. Um, and uh, we've got one or two sites um, with some fantastic data coming already. And we're trying to add additional priors. For example, if we know that animals were hunted in the autumn at a site, we can, we can force the model to, to take the tooth, the part of the tooth that's autumn forming to say, you must be in within 50 kilometers of this site at that part of the tooth. And then that, that um, is an additional prior that we can add to, to force the model to, to take the take the journey through that point at that point in the tooth, which then affects all the other assignments, of course, as well, because there's a knock on effect. So we're trying to now um, play with different ways of, of making these geographical assignments work in our sites in the Paris Basin and in the south of France. It's also going to form a pivotal part. I'm going to have my last slide um, just mentioning a new project that I'm starting on now, which I'm so excited to start on, um, Paleoscot, which is um, a five-year project that will be looking at people, animals, landscapes, and environments of late glacial Scotland. Now, uh, the late glacial period in Scotland is probably one of the best characterized periods of the Quaternary in terms of the environment. Uh, there's been so much work done, but there's been very, very little archeology. span In fact, until about a decade or so ago, no one even believed we had a Paleolithic in Scotland, but we do, it's established, but there's very little archeology, span literally a couple of handfuls of stone tools and that's it. So we're never gonna have the, the rich archeological remains of the Dordoin. We're, we're never gonna have that, but we know we had people here um, by about, 13 or 12,000. So pre the start of the Holocene, we know we had them here in the terminal um, in the late Pleistocene. But the question is, is how can we better understand that environment when we've, and, and the people within those landscapes without having very much archeology. span So here I'm, I'm taking a, a, a very animal centered approach to the archeology. span So thinking about the species that would have um, pioneered recolonization of this deglaciating landscape that would have come here first, would have attracted people and then using those collections, performing isotope analysis, um, and other approaches to try and understand um, the sort of ecosystems that pioneering human populations encountered and to better understand the constraints and potentials of human activity and ultimately to try to take that data and to pool it with existing environmental data and even model where we might expect to find um, late glacial sites in Scotland at that time. And what I would love to see is with the reined in movements for us to be able to, um, so for example, to, to remains like this, for us to be able to apply our intratooth sampling methods, our strontium isotope assignments, and to see if biological connections at that time, a time when uh, the UK was still very much um, uh, part of a, sinu a single landmass with Northwest Europe, 
to see whether the, the glimmers of cultural connections we're getting from the upper Paleolithic tools and, and the study of those assemblages, whether it's mirroring biological connections that we're getting with the, with the faunal communities that were pioneer species within these landscapes. So that's everything, um, but this work is, is very much teamwork and, um, and a whole lot of different teams too, and has been uh, some total of about the last sort of 10, 13 years of my life. So, um, and, and with special thanks to all of these people and our funders and to you guys for listening. My stop sharing. <laughs>